The Man of Property by John Galsworthy. Those privileged to be present at a family festival of the Forsytes have seen that charming and instructive sight, an upper-middle-class family in full plumage. On June the 15th, 1886, about four of the afternoon, the observer who chanced to be present at the house of old Jolian Forsyte in Stanhope Gate might have seen the highest efflorescence of the Forsytes. This was the occasion of an at-home to celebrate the engagement of Miss June Forsyte, old Jolian's granddaughter, to Mr Philip Bossini. In the bravery of light gloves, buff waistcoats, feathers and frocks, the family were present, even Aunt Anne, who now but seldom left the corner of her brother Timothy's green drawing-room. Even Aunt Anne was there, her inflexible back and the dignity of her calm old face personifying the rigid possessiveness of the family idea. When a Forsyte was engaged, married or born, the Forsytes were present. When a Forsyte died, but no Forsyte had as yet died, they didn't die, death being contrary to their principles. About the Forsytes, mingling that day with the crowd of other guests, there was a more than ordinarily groomed look, an alert, inquisitive assurance, a brilliant respectability, as though they were attired in defiance of something. The habitual sniff on the face of Soames' foresight had spread through their ranks. They were on their guard. The Forsytes were resentful of something, not individually, but as a family. This resentment expressed itself in an added perfection of raiment, an exuberance of family cordiality, an exaggeration of family importance, and the sniff. Danger was what the Forsytes scented. For the first time, as a family, they appeared to have an instinct of being in contact with some strange and unsafe thing. Over against the piano, a man of bulk and stature was wearing two waistcoats on his wide chest, two waistcoats and a ruby pin. And his shaven, square old face, the colour of pale leather, with his pale eyes, had its most dignified look above his satin stock. This was Swithin Forsyte. Close to the window, where he could get more than his fair share of fresh air, his twin James, the fat and the lean of it, old Jolian called these brothers, also over six feet in height, but very lean, brooded over the scene with his permanent stoop. His grey eyes had an air of fixed absorption in some secret worry. In his hands he turned and turned a piece of china. Not far off, listening to a lady in brown, his only son, Soames, pale and well-shaved, dark-haired, rather bald, had poked his chin up sideways, carrying his nose with that aforesaid appearance of sniff, as though despising an egg which he knew he could not digest. Beside him, his cousin, the tall George, son of the fifth Forsyte, Roger, had a quilpish look on his fleshy face, pondering one of his sardonic jests. Something inherent to the occasion had affected them all. Seated in a row close to one another were three ladies, aunts Anne, Hester, the two foresight maids, and Julie, short for Julia, who, not in first youth, had so far forgotten herself as to marry Septimus Small, a man of poor constitution. She had survived him for many years. With her elder and younger sister, she lived now in the house of Timothy, her sixth and youngest brother, on the Bayswater Road. In the centre of the room, under the chandelier, as became a host, stood the head of the family, old Jolian himself. Eighty years of age, with his fine white hair, his dome-like forehead, his little dark grey eyes, and an immense white moustache which drooped and spread below the level of his strong jaw, he had a patriarchal look, and in spite of his lean cheeks and hollows at his temples, seemed master of perennial youth. Between him and the four other brothers who were present, James, Swithin, Nicholas and Roger, there was much difference, much similarity. In turn, each of these four brothers was very different from the other, yet they too were alike. At one time or another during the afternoon, all these faces, so dissimilar and so alike, had worn an expression of distrust, the object of which was undoubtedly the man whose acquaintance they were thus assembled to make. Philip Bossini was known to be a young man without fortune, but Forsyte girls had become engaged to such before and had actually married them. 
It was not altogether for this reason, therefore, that the minds of the Forsytes misgave them. What indeed was this young man, who, in becoming engaged to June, old Jolian's acknowledged heiress, had done so well for himself? He was an architect, not in itself a sufficient reason for wearing such a hat. None of the Forsytes happened to be architects, but one of them knew two architects, who would never have worn such a hat upon a call of ceremony in the London season. Dangerous. Ah, dangerous. June, of course, had not seen this, but, though not yet nineteen, she was notorious. Had she not said to Mrs. Soames, who was always so beautifully dressed, that feathers were vulgar? Mrs. Soames had actually given up wearing feathers, so dreadfully downright was dear June. These misgivings, the disapproval and perfectly genuine distrust, did not prevent the Forsytes from gathering to old Jolian's invitation. An at-home at Stanhope Gate was a great rarity. None had been held for twelve years, not indeed since old Mrs. Jolian died. Never had there been so full an assembly, for, mysteriously united in spite of all their differences, they had taken arms against a common peril. The author of their uneasiness stood talking to June by the further door. His curly hair had a rumpled appearance, as though he found what was going on around him unusual. He had an air, too, of having a joke all to himself. George, speaking aside to his brother Eustace, said, "'Looks as if he might make a bolt for it, the dashing buccaneer.' And every now and then a foresight would come up, sidle round, and take a look at him. June stood in front, fending off this idle curiosity, a little bit of a thing. As somebody once said, all hair and spirit, with fearless blue eyes, a firm jaw, and a bright colour, whose face and body seemed too slender for her crown of red-gold hair. A tall woman, with a beautiful figure, which some member of the family had once compared to a heathen goddess, stood looking at these two with a shadowy smile. Her hands, gloved in French grey, were crossed one over the other, her grave, charming face held to one side, and the eyes of all men near were fastened on it. Her figure swayed so balanced that the very air seemed to set it moving. There was warmth but little colour in her cheeks. Her large, dark eyes were soft. But it was at her lips, asking a question, giving an answer, with that shadowy smile, that men looked. They were sensitive lips, sensuous and sweet, and through them seemed to come warmth and perfume, like the warmth and perfume of a flower. The engaged couple thus scrutinised were unconscious of this passive goddess. It was Bassini who first noticed her, and asked her name. June took her lover up to the woman with the beautiful figure. Irene is my greatest chum, she said. Please be good friends, you two. At the little lady's command, they all three smiled. And while they were smiling, Soames' foresight, silently appearing from behind the woman with the beautiful figure, who was his wife, said, Ah, introduce me too. He was seldom indeed far from Irene's side at public functions, and even when separated by the exigencies of social intercourse, could be seen following her about with his eyes, in which were strange expressions of watchfulness and longing. At the window, his father, James, was still scrutinising the marks on the piece of china. "'I wonder at Jolian's allowing this engagement,' he said to Aunt Anne. "'They tell me there's no chance of their getting married for years. "'This young Bassini has got nothing. "'When Winifred married Darty, I made him bring every penny into settlement. "'Lucky thing, too. They'd have had nothing by this time.' Aunt Anne looked up from her velvet chair. Grey curls banded her forehead, curls that, unchanged for decades, had extinguished in the family all sense of time. She made no reply, for she rarely spoke, husbanding her aged voice. But to James, uneasy of conscience, her look was as good as an answer. Well, he said, I couldn't help Irene's having no money. Soames was in such a hurry. He got quite thin, dancing attendance on her. Putting the bowl pettishly down on the piano, he let his eyes wander to the group by the door. "'It's my opinion,' he said unexpectedly, "'that it's just as well as it is.' Aunt Anne didn't ask him to explain this strange utterance. She knew what he was thinking. 
If Irene had no money, she wouldn't be so foolish as to do anything wrong. For they said, they said, she'd been asking for a separate room. But of course, Soames had not... James interrupted her reverie. Julian, he will have his own way. He's got no children. And stopped, recollecting the continued existence of old Julian's son, young Julian, June's father, who had made such a mess of it and done for himself by deserting his wife and child and running away with that foreign governess. Well, he resumed hastily, if he likes to do these things, I suppose he can afford to. I suppose he'll give June a thousand a year. He's got nobody else to leave his money to. At this, Aunt Anne, too, thought of June's father, young Julian, who had run away with that foreign girl. Ah, thought Anne, what a sad blow to his father, and to them all. Such a promising young fellow. A sad blow, though there had been no public scandal, most fortunately, Joe's wife seeking for no divorce, a long time ago. And when June's mother died six years ago, Joe had married that woman, and they had two children now, and lived in St. John's Wood, so she had heard. Still, he had forfeited his right to be there, had cheated her of the complete fulfilment of her family pride, deprived her of the rightful pleasure of seeing and kissing him of whom she had been so proud. Such a promising young fellow. The thought rankled with the bitterness of long-inflicted injury in her tenacious old heart. A little water stood in her eyes. With a handkerchief of the finest lawn, she wiped them stealthily. Well, Aunt Anne, said a voice behind. Soames Forsyte, flat-shouldered, clean-shaven, flat-cheeked, flat-waisted, yet with something round and secret about his whole appearance, looked downwards and aslant at Aunt Anne, as though trying to see through the side of his own nose. And what do you think of the engagement? he asked. Aunt Anne's eyes rested on him proudly. The eldest of the nephews, since young Jolian's departure from the family nest, he was now her favourite, for she recognised in him a sure trustee of the family soul that must so soon slip beyond her keeping. Very nice for the young man, she said, and he's a good-looking young fellow, but I doubt if he's quite the lover for dear June. Soames touched the edge of a gold-lacquered lustre, She'll tame him, he said, stealthily wetting his finger and rubbing it on the knobby bulbs. Hmm, that's genuine old lacquer. You can't get it nowadays. It'd do well in a sale at Jobson's. He spoke with relish, as though he felt that he was cheering up his old aunt. It was seldom he was so confidential. I wouldn't mind having it myself, he added. You can always get your price for old lacquer. You're so clever with all those things, said Aunt Anne. And how is dear Irene? Soames's smile died. Pretty well, he said. Complains she can't sleep. She sleeps a great deal better than I do. And he looked at his wife, who was talking to Bassini by the door. Aunt Anne sighed. Perhaps, she said, it will be just as well for her not to see so much of June. She's such a decided character, dear June. Soames flushed. His flushes passed rapidly over his flat cheeks and centred between his eyes, where they remained, the stamp of disturbing thoughts. Mm -hmm.